All right, good afternoon. All right, good afternoon, it's 3.32. Uh, I'd like to call the, the meeting to order and we'll begin with the roll call of commission members. Um, commission members, please uh, let us know if you're here present um, and confirm that you can see and hear me. Uh, Commissioner Hughes. Present, I can see and hear you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Ponce. Present, I can see and hear you. All right, and I'm here as well, of course, and so we have a quorum. Um, in 2022, Governor Pritzker signed Public Act 101-0640, making certain amendments to the Open Meetings Act so that we, along with our boards and commissions, can continue to host virtual meetings during the COVID-19 public health emergency, provided that certain conditions are met. One of those uh, conditions is that Chairman Wong of the Commission on Chicago Landmarks determines that an in-person meeting of the Commission on Chicago Landmarks and its permit review committee are not practical or prudent. Chairman Wong is determined pursuant to section 7E2 of the Open Meetings Act that an in-person meeting of this commission on Chicago landmarks and its permit review committee is not practical or prudent. He is also determined pursuant to section 7E5 that because of the disaster as declared by the governor, it is infeasible for at least one member of the commission on Chicago landmarks or its chief administrative officer or its chief legal officer to be physically present at the meeting place for either meeting as much as there is no physical meeting place. Pursuant to a resolution adopted by the Commission on Chicago Landmarks on June 4, 2020, regarding the chairman's emergency rulemaking powers, Chairman Wong issued emergency rules governing the conduct of remote public commission meetings and provisions for remote public participation, effective February 18th, 2022. These rules are posted on the commission's website. In lines with these emergency rules, today's regular permit review committee meeting is a virtual meeting being simulcast to the general public via live streaming. Permit review committees have been held virtually since May of 2020. Meetings are structured to minimize the chances for technical difficulties. Meetings for the uh, meetings of the general public have been, members of the general public have been encouraged to submit written statements in advance of the meeting. And these have been posted on the commission's website and are available for public view during the meeting at www.chicago.gov slash CCL. Per the emergency rules, verbal statements by the general public for all agenda items will take place at the beginning of the meeting. So, so all those wishing to speak at today's meeting should be signed into the Zoom meeting at this time. Before we hear staff presentations on the agenda items and ask to hear from owners or applicants and their teams, we open the floor to members of the general public who wish to comment about the items to be heard on today's agenda. Members of the general, members of the public wishing to comment should use the raise hand function of Zoom to indicate that they wish to speak. Members of the public not using a smartphone or computer and instead phoning in um, to the meeting should press star nine to activate the raise hand function and do the same to deactivate it. I or the meeting facilitator will call out the names one by one and unmute those people. Once unmuted, speakers should give their full name and organization, if any, they represent. Each speaker is allocated three minutes to speak. Once all members of the general public wish to make comments uh, have been given an opportunity to do so, we will go through the agenda. I would ask that owners or applicants and their representatives, as well as aldermen, wait to speak until after staff presentations have been made uh, on their agenda item. Please note that one of the projects um, listed on the draft agenda, 3500 West Douglas, the Jewish uh, People's Institute is not included on today's agenda. It was removed at the request of the property owner, so we will not be hearing statements regarding this item at today's meeting. All right, I'd like to go through the agenda items to allow for public comment this time. First is agenda item one, the project at 640 West Irving Park, Immaculata High School. Are there any members of the general public wishing to speak on this item. I see, I see one. Can you please hear from um, Mr. Ward Miller? Uh, good afternoon, Chairman. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Yes, you know, um, we are, um, we, we, I think we share uh, the excitement of the renovation and, and restoration of the Barry Byrne designed uh, Immaculata High School, uh, the former Immaculata High School, which has now been as an Islamic center for a while. Uh, uh, and I think that's 
uh, a really wonderful aspect referring to the historic building. I want you to know that Preservation Chicago doesn't take a stand on new construction. Uh, so I don't think we can really talk about the tower um, or the additional buildings that are uh, being presented today. I know there are com uh, community concerns and that's been uh, qu quite a, there have been quite a few public meetings and community meetings about this. Uh, there's probably no great balance or solution, uh, but I, I want to suggest um, that uh, the original historical landmark building, uh, the, the former Immaculata High School, uh, every effort be taken to uh, restore that building on its exterior uh, uh, to, um, to make that a viable uh, uh, structure again. It seems like it's been partially languishing uh, for a little while, and it's an important building, uh, not only to the legacy of Chicago, but to our lakefront, our park system, and of course that neighborhood. Uh, and I, uh, we do applaud the developer for um, and and the city uh, for their attention uh, to this important building. Um, we would like to see uh, perhaps the auditorium. Uh, preserved as a community space, if possible. And it'd be wonderful to even see a facsimile, if not the original um, statue uh, that was over the auditorium entrance that has been a sort of a blank uh, gap, if you will, in the archway, uh, restored uh, in some way. Uh, we know where the originals were, are. They were at the Smart Museum. They've now transferred to the Ian Ellie studios in Park Ridge. So a facsimile would be easily replaceable and uh, is really so much a part of the integrity and design of, of Barry Burns' masterpiece. Um, I also want to say on a personal note, my grandmother Miller attended Immaculata High School uh, and it's, uh, it's a beautiful structure even with its additions that were added also later by Barry Burns. So uh, just want to say the more we can save and preserve of the original building's integrity and some of its interior space is perhaps the, the best uh, outcome of all, even if it is a residential development. So uh, we just wanted to offer our support for those more historic aspects that are part of the landmark designation of the Immaculata High School building. Thank you. Perfect timing. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Um, I don't see any other hands up for this item. Um, seeing none, uh, let's move to item number two on the agenda, which is the project at 40 East Burton in the Astor Street District. Are there any members of the general public wishing to speak on this item? Um, seeing none. So we'll move to agenda item number three, which is the project at 1357 North Elston the Morton Salt Company Warehouse Complex. Are there any members of the general public wishing to speak on this one, on this item? All right, seeing, I'm seeing none. Um, so let's move to uh, agenda item four, the project at 530 West Fulton in the Mid North District. Are there any members of the general public wishing to speak on um, this item? Seeing none. Agenda, we'll move to agenda item number five, the project at 858 West Belden in the McCormick Rojau district. Are there any members of the general public wishing to speak on this item? Seeing none, um, we'll move to agenda item number six, the project at 5054 South Greenwood in the Kenwood district. Are there any members of the public wishing to speak on this one? At uh, seeing none, agenda item number seven is the project at 651 North State Street in the near north um, side multiple property district. Are there any members of the general public wishing to speak on this item? All right, seeing none, I seeing one, um, Mr. Ward Miller. Uh, hi, Commissioner. Um, Mr. Chairman and members of the Permit Review Committee of the Commission on Chicago Landmarks. Uh, we were very much involved in the, uh, in the creation of the Near North Landmark District. And I don't think we have enough true information on what's occurring here, but we are hopeful that uh, this will be 
uh, respectful of the integrity of the building at 651 North State and look forward to a reinvestment in these structures. Uh, so oftentimes we forget that uh, a reinvestment in our landmark buildings is development and it's really the most sensitive type of development so with this project and others, uh, I want you to know uh, Preservation Chicago uh, oftentimes admires uh, the, the reinvestment in these landmark buildings and in these landmark districts. So uh, while we can't offer our, um, our, our, our enthusiastic support, I want you to know overall, um, we at Preservation Chicago uh, really do honor and uh, recognize these investments in our landmark buildings as uh, true and wonderful development. And I don't think we should forget that. And we're grateful uh, to all of you on the Permit Review Committee for your dedication uh, to overseeing these projects as well as uh, landmark staff. Uh, so we are grateful in every regard. Uh, and that's the extent of my comments on uh, the remainder of the, the structures. and. We'll be here if you have any, if you'd like to refer back to us. <laughs> uh, thank you so much again for your time and dedication to uh, this really, really important uh, meeting that happens each month as it impacts our landmarks uh, so profoundly. All my best, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Um, and uh, let's move to agenda item number eight, um, the project at 2211 West Walton in the Ukrainian Village District. Are there any members of the public that would like to speak on this item? Seeing none. Um, finally, we have uh, agenda item nine, which is the project at 1107 West Fulton Market in the Fulton Randolph Market District. Are there any members of the general public wishing to speak on this item? All right, um, seeing none. I believe that is all the members of the general public who have indicated they wish to speak on today's agenda items. Therefore, this concludes the public comment portion of the meeting and we will go through the agenda, which will begin with the approval of the minutes from our regular meeting of June 6th, 2022. Um, commissioners, uh, as a reminder, when you wish to speak, make, make a motion, second a motion, please use the raise hand function. Um, and I'd like to request a motion to approve the minutes of the June 6th, uh, 2022 meeting. We have a motion. So moved. Thank you, Commissioner Pinson moves. Let's made a motion. Do we have a second? Second, Commissioner Hughes. Seconded by Commissioner Hughes. Um, and I'm a yes. Um, and this motion carries unanimously. The minutes have been approved and will be posted on the commission's website. Um, let's move to the first project, um, 640 West Irving Park in the 46th Ward, Maculata High School, um, which is the proposed exterior and interior rehabilitation of four story, of a four story historic school and covent and convent to accommodate 250 residential units and construction of a new detached 22 story senior building containing 108, 108 independent living units, 32 memory care units, 60 assisted living units, and 98 parking spaces behind the historic building. And Emily, Bar Emily Barton has the presentation. Thank you, Commissioner. So uh, Immaculata High School, as you are probably all aware, is located at the corner of Irving Park and Marine. The rehab of the historic building is part of a larger development project. Um, so this presentation today to PRC is to review the rehabilitation work to the historic building. The new construction tower located behind the historic building that partially sits in the existing parking lot is presented for informational purposes and will be reviewed by plan commission later this month. So the landmark property consists of the 1922 Prairie Style School a 1955 convent addition to the north, and the 1956 school addition on the west. Um, these were all designed by prominent architect Barry Byrne. And the overall configuration is U-shaped with the main buildings facing Irving Park and Marine. The 1983 designation ordinance is silent on significant features. 
the entire building is designated. Uh, because the designation ordinance does not specifically identify which interior spaces are significant, staff has visited the site, considered the existing conditions, significance and integrity of interior spaces, as well as their accessibility to the general public in order to determine which interior spaces are the most significant. The applicant has also provided site plans and photos of the building's interior included in the packet. Based on the site visit and information submitted by the applicant, staff recommends that the main entrance lobby, the central cast iron stairs, and the two-story auditorium space all within the 1922 structure be considered significant interior features for the purposes of permit review. The ornamental cast iron stairs outside the auditorium, which provide primary access to the gym and upper floors, uh, are proposed to be retained. However, because of um, fire safety codes to convert to residential, these stairs must be enclosed with fire rated walls. The applicant is proposing to enclose the stair vestibule on the east and west sides in order to meet this code. The western side will be a storefront system of fire rated glass. Um, according to the architect, because of the significant costs associated with rated glass, the eastern side will be a combination of a similar rated storefront and a rated drywall partition. The drywall partition is proposed to be held off approximately four to six inches from the stair. Um, and staff recommends approval as proposed with details of this connection to be included with the permit application. The applicant is proposing to construct a roof deck on the flat roof of the building at the west end of the property, which is the, the school, the 1956 school edition. This roof deck has a slight setback from the north parapet where it will be screened by the adjacent tower and approximately a 35 foot setback uh, from the south parapet. New black metal panel elevator and stair extensions are also proposed to access the deck. The applicant has provided some photo renderings to clarify the extent of visibility from Urban Park Road. Based on their renderings, the elevator and stair enclosure extensions and the prefabricated planters will be minimally visible from Urban Park. There is some precedence for a visible metal clad elevator overrun as there is an existing one on the north elevation of the original 1922 building. Additionally, all roof elements are proposed to be added to the 1956 school edition, which has a flat uh, roof. So based on the location, size and visibility rendering, staff recommends approval with the condition that all material samples be submitted to staff with the permit application. Many of the aluminum windows on the 1950s portion of the property were replaced without approval in 2013. The applicant proposes to replace these windows with new windows configured to match the original. The applicant will be investigating the condition of the existing historic windows on the 1922 portion of the property and intends to retain those which can be repaired to meet their project needs. Additionally, there are several stained glass window panels which must be retained. Staff shall review and approve all existing and proposed window details with the permit application. On the north courtyard elevation uh, of the building, the applicant proposes to modify some existing glass block windows into operable windows in order to address the light and vent requirements needed. Similarly, they propose to install new window openings at the basement level of the north elevation, um, matching the size, orientation, and location of the existing basement level windows. Because these windows are on a secondary elevation and are compatible with existing window locations, staff recommends approval. Okay, so as I mentioned previously, the larger project also includes a new senior housing tower to be constructed on the vacant lots behind the historic complex. Currently, the area is used for surface parking and a portion of it is within the boundary of the landmark parcel, which you can see um, shown in red. This tower has been designed to fit the context of the surrounding area. It is not attached to the historic building and staff recommends that due to the siting, location and scale, the proposed tower will not be an adverse effect to the landmark building. 
uh, State Historic Preservation uh, staff in Springfield also believe the proposed tower to be an acceptable addition within the context of the landmark and National Register nominations. The new tower will be reviewed by the Chicago Plan Commission later this month. Per the applicant, over the last decade, the history, the historic building has been significantly underutilized and has suffered deferred maintenance. Um, the estimated cost for the adaptive reuse of the historic building is in excess of $65 million. Um, the additional development of the site with a senior building helps to offset some of these costs. Uh, the combined development is really what is making the rehabilitation of the historic campus possible. So the proposed senior building will be freestanding and not attached at any point to the Immaculata buildings. Um, it doesn't block views of the building from any main, you know, from the main public right of way and was designed to reflect urban skyscraper context. Um, and the property is largely entered um, from the rear off of Bittersweet behind the complex. The massing and plan resembles an upside down T shape um, with approximately 12,900 square feet per floor plate as it rises above the fifth floor. The ground floor contains lot, the lobby and common space for residences. Um, the second to fourth floors will contain parking for 118 cars. And from the fifth floor up, the residential units consist of 32 memory care units, 60 assisted living, and 108 independent living units with amenity space. The base of the building is to be clad in brick and metal panels, which will distinguish it from the historic building and provide a material palette consistent with the neighborhood, while the upper stories are clad with um, in glass with a vertical expression. The applicant has provided several perspective renderings to better illustrate how the new structure will be perceived as a backdrop to the landmark building. Staff recommends that due to the siding, location, and scale, the proposed tower will not be an adverse effect to the landmark building. So staff is recommending approval of the uh, rehabilitation work with the conditions listed. Um, a number of support letters were included in your packet. Uh, and I believe we've got the whole team here, as well as Alderman Kappelman, um, if you would like to make a statement as well. Thanks so much, Emily. Um, any questions for Emily before we go to, um, does it look like uh, Mr. Uh, Alderman Kappelman would like to speak first on this one? Sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm OK. <laughs> OK. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I have a very extensive zoning process that has over 30 members from all different segments of this very diverse ward where over 92 different languages are spoken. Um, and because over 20% of the 46 ward residents rely on a low income, we also have 20% of our zoning members who represent uh, this group as well. Um, this development proposal has been before the community since January 2020, right before the COVID outbreak. And we've had many, many, many meetings um, and lots of negotiations to get where, where we are today. Um, but but uh, one, one uh, zoning member stated this really well and I, and I took this down. Uh, he said, uh, the property has been on the market for many years and this may easily be the last chance to save this historic landmark buildings that are on this property. Uh, I, I believe we're lucky to have so many beautiful and historically significant buildings in the 46th Ward and the risk of losing these buildings is just too great if we wait much longer to restore them. Um, there was a vote, uh, 21 in favor, seven opposed and three abstaining. Um, I agree with the 46 Ward Zoning Development Committee that the benefits far outweigh the negative repercussions that are also present. So I ask for your support on this as well. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman, um, for providing all that context for that. Um, any questions for the Alderman? Um, if none yet, let's uh, let's hear from the applicant and applicant representatives. I believe uh, Rolando Costa is here. I am Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, Good afternoon. everyone. I'm Rolando Acosta. I am the attorney for the 
project. Here with me today is Keith Giles from K Giles, a developer for the project. Uh, Keith recently, well, not so recently now, maybe 10 years ago, was also the uh, lead developer for the rehabilitation and reuse of the old colony building, a very significant city of Chicago landmark, which for rehabilitation, I think, was well received. I also have Greg Gibson from Level Architecture. He is the architect for the Immaculata existing buildings, the restoration architect for this project. I have Jerry Wallach from Perkins Eastman. He is the architect for the new building, the senior building that was previously mentioned, as well as Emily Ramsey, who has been helping us throughout uh, with the landmark issues associated with this project, not only at the city, but at the state level. And actually, the uh, after the state review, we, we sent a proposal off to the National Park Service, which also reviewed it and from a blue sheet review, very preliminary, and found that it was compatible with the uh, landmark. So we've taken every step on the way here uh, in an effort to cover all of our bases. We also spent a considerable amount of time with the Department of Planning and Development's excellent uh, design staff on the tower, the new building, its particular uh, aspects to it, uh, and a good bit of time uh, with Larry Schur before Emily took over for this project, before he retired, uh, reviewing all of the elements of the landmark restoration. So we're very pleased to be here. As the alderman said, it's been over uh, two years that we've been in the community. We've been through all of these reviews. We've had more than a dozen community meetings. In addition to the alderman's committee, which is a very diverse and extensive one, uh, we also met with many community groups. We have the support of the Buena Park Neighbors Association, which is our immediate community, and also of the Uptown United, which is the local chamber of commerce uh, for Uptown area. We believe this is important. I actually, on a personal note, used to live on Bittersweet. Remember when this building went out of service as a school and became a property of the Islamic College. It has been underutilized for many, many years. It needs significant TLC, if nothing else, uh, but the systems need to be upgraded and we have a viable use. I wanted to just comment on two facts. We have reduced the unit count slightly as a result of late uh, discussions with the community. So we're at 245 in the Immaculata building. We're a total of two in the senior building. Slight reduction, doesn't affect anything you've seen. This is all internal machinations uh, for the project. With that, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I wanna open it up for questions because I know you've had a long day. Mm -hmm. Commissioners, we have any questions for the applicant representatives. Um, my question. Yes, Commissioner Hughes. Yeah, my question was, um, has the design team started thinking about the materials for um, the new vertical components on the existing buildings? The simple answer is yes, but the more architectural answer will come from Jerry Wallach. No, I thought Rolando and Emily Barton did a great job of sort of describing this and summarizing right now. I think as she stated, we have a combination of brick, uh, stone and metal on the base to be complementary to the existing building. And then the tower a little bit more traditionally glass, steel and metal panel. Sorry, I think I, I meant the existing, I meant I meant the new um, vertical components that's being added uh, to the existing The building. rooftop elements. Oh, yeah. okay. All oh, right. I'm sorry, that goes to Greg. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we have. So right now we're planning for those to be a black ACM. Uh, obviously, that sample would be something that is part of the conditions that you guys get to review and approve that. Uh, we found that to be, you know, a pretty neutral solution in the past um, and hope that you'll find it acceptable this time as well. The, there's just a couple pieces, um, an elevator that's going to stop at the roof and then a stair extension. Um, and those exist on the 1950s school addition to the west. Um, we are also going to repair as necessary any portions of the existing um, 1920s building, which exists at the corner. Um, those repairs would be done in like materials. Mm -hmm. um, there's also the potential that a new elevator in that building extends through the roof. Um, and the, the roof features 
for the existing 1920s building have been done out of uh, copper, which is patinaed. Um, and so anything that needs to be repaired from that standpoint would match those materials. Mm. Uh, that yeah, and the illustrations, the black felt very, um, I know it's, in, it's intentionally setting itself apart from the existing building, but it felt very heavy and dark. Um, but if you said it exists already in other portions of the building, um, I guess that would make that acceptable. <clears throat> I think the other thing to remember about this view is that not only are there a couple pieces on the 1950s edition that are pushed back a pretty fair distance from the Marine Drive side, or I'm sorry, from the Irving Park side parapet, there's also this new tower that's going to extend up beyond. Mm -hmm. um, so you may not really read these piece, these pieces once you have this new kind of background piece that yeah that's stealing all of the <laughs> all the view um yeah. no that that makes sense greg my my other question was for emily um with the tower with the new tower uh being added and impeding into the boundary does the boundary change so the boundary will not change um, because at least to my understanding, it is keeping the same pin. Um, it will just be that, and that's why, you know, really we have any review over it at all was to, you know, kind of make sure that the siting wouldn't affect um, the actual lot and parcel that, that the complex is on. Mm -hmm. um, but Rolando, I'm sure would be able to, to answer um, if, if it's, is the pin changing? <laughs> uh, so the property currently has one pin for the entire property. It's likely it'll go to two pins. Mm -hmm. The one pin would cover the Immaculata building, the current 1920s plus 1950s buildings. And then one pin would cover what is effectively the parking lot. Now, part of the parking lot is already in the landmark district. So it would be that little piece, I guess, that fronts on bittersweet that would be outside, you know. So the second sort of pin thrust. would be the, the second pin would be the new tower then as a part of that parking lot? It would be the new tower, but the, the tower covers most of the parking lot. Mm -hmm. So I would say most of the tower is within the landmark district. And then it's almost like it's forecourt because the tower is set back 50 feet from the property. So that may actually be just forecourt four or open space in front of the tower. I have to, I don't know exactly where the line is over there. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so you'd have, you'd have a situation where part of the pin, the new pin would be in the landmark district, a piece would not. Hmm. Seems like that would be an opportunity to, to rebound that landmark space um, around the new pin. But that's, I guess that would be for Emily and the staff to decide. Yeah, and we, we wouldn't have any objection. I mean, you know, it's it's all one project for us. So it's not like uh, we're planning anything in front of this new senior building. Right. Sounds good. Um, any other uh, questions? Um, seeing none, I just uh, want to just comment that I think uh, it's wonderful to see a second use for, for these significant buildings. Um, and I think it's a really exciting development for the 46 ward. And ward, I know it's it's a lot, definitely very opinionated ward. So it's really great to see that that there was um, a, a lot of um, uh, people around uh, surrounding this, supporting this project. So um, with that, uh, I did have one question, curiosity on the auditorium. Can you talk a little bit about the um, how that's going to be programmed and used for the building? Because I think that's pretty pretty unique feature. So the auditorium is intended to stay as an auditorium and be used as amenity space for the residents in the building. We've also made a, a commitment to the community that for community events, the community would be able to use the auditorium. They'd have to be events in keeping with the nature of the building. So we're not gonna have rock concerts or something like that in the yeah. auditorium, but uh, for community gatherings and meetings, it would be opened up to the community. So the public would still get to enjoy that space uh, as an auditorium. Great. Thank you. Um, any other questions, commissioners? 
I just wanted to congratulate um, all of you for this exciting project. I had a lot of fun going through the packet and um, it's, a, it's a wonderful project. Happy to see it. Thank you, Commissioner Ponce. Um, with that, I think i um, like to request a motion um, to adopt the staff recommendation for the project. Um, do we have a motion? I moved, Commissioner Hughes. Commissioner Hughes has uh, has made a motion. Do we have a second? You have a second. All right, Commissioner Ponce seconds, and um, I am also a yes. So the motion carries unanimously. Congratulations um, to the Thank team. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Good luck. Um, all right. So the. Uh, the second project is uh, 40 East Burton on the 43rd Ward, uh, Astra Street District. Um, and um, we're talking about the proposed interior and exterior renovation of a three-story brick single family residence with a one-story addition and an attached four-car garage with a roof deck. And um, we looks like Joyce is gonna give us the presentation for this one. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This three-story brick Georgian Revival single-family residence was built in 1909 and was designed by Schmidt, Carter, and Martin. The applicant reached out to historic preservation staff in May with their initial proposal and a revised submittal was received in June. The subject property is located at the corner of Astor and Burton on a 57 foot by 105 foot lot, which is atypical for the district as it is unusually wide and deep. The building is located at the west side of the lot with no rear yard and a substantial side yard, which is visible from Burton Place. A non-historic detached two-car brick garage is located in the side yard, and according to Sanborn maps, the garage was constructed sometime after 1950. The garage is accessed via an existing curb cut from Burton Place, and the existing garage and retaining wall are proposed to be demolished. The proposed side addition will be constructed on the east elevation and will include an exercise room and laundry room on the basement level and a terrace and kitchen on the first floor level. The terrace will have a masonry guardrail with a limestone cap and decorative iron railing infills, and the total height of the addition is nine foot six inches above grade. The addition will be clad in brick that matches the main house and will project one foot four inches from the front facade of the main house to differentiate it from the historic building. New awning windows with an iron that iron security bars are proposed for the basement level. Stan staff recommends approval for the new windows as proposed. The new windows shall be wood or clad wood windows, and the permit drawing shall include large scale dimension drawings of the proposed windows for each window type through the sill, head, muttons, mullions, brick mold, and trim. Attached to the addition will be a four car brick garage. The south elevation will have an 18 foot wide garage door that is accessed from Burton Place. And the east elevation, which faces the alley, will also have an 18 foot wide garage door. And these garage doors will be custom wood panel doors with divided light glazing. The garage will also be clad in the same brick that matches the main house and is set back nine foot nine and a half inches from the proposed new addition. The applicant wishes to utilize the roof above the garage as a roof deck, and the parapet of the garage will extend three foot six inches above the roof deck with a limestone coping. The total height of the garage is 14 feet above grade. As a note, the committee has approved another visible site addition and garage with similar site constraints at 10201 South Sealy in the Longwood Drive District. The applicant has provided renderings from vantage points east, west, and directly in front of the property to better describe the visual impact to the building. And staff recommends approval of the side yard addition and garage as proposed. The applicant provided brick samples for review. And the sample is composed of several brick types, which will be randomly mixed during installation. The proposed bricks closely match the historic brick in size, shape, color, and finish, and are approved as proposed. Um, staff also recommends that the new mortar to match the historic mortar and color, joint profile, texture, and strength and type. The applicant is also proposing tuck pointing, basement window replacement, and damaged slate roof replacement on the main house. Historic preservation staff recommends the replacement slate tiles to match the historic slate in size, color, texture, and finish. And a sample of the slate should be provided to staff for review and approval. The bay window on the west elevation and the third floor balcony on the east elevation is currently enclosed with windows and is proposed to be restored to the original open balcony design. 
as based on historic photos and the original design drawings. That east elevation will also have new doors located on the same masonry openings as to remove windows. And these doors will have the same design and light pattern as the previous windows and will open out onto the new terrace. Staff recommends approval of this additional work as proposed. Okay, so finally, staff recommends approval for the new scope of work with the conditions mentioned during this presentation and also listed on this slide. The alderman has reviewed and has reviewed the proposal and provided a letter of support. And this concludes my presentation. If you have any questions about my presentation or for the owner, architect, and attorney, we're also here today. Please let us know. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joyce. Um, any questions for Joyce before we go to the applicant? Um, seeing none, um, let's hear from the applicant. Um, is it Chris Pintin? Chris Pintinix. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, good afternoon. Um, we are, I'm from Premier Properties Group. We've been working with uh, the owner and the architect to um, redesign this underutilized property um, for the owners who are making a large commitment um, in this deteriorated, what's been deteriorating property um, and are excited to make it um, their home for a long period of time. Um, we've, what we're proposing is to basically um, the existing home, we're um, restoring what's there. There's not really any, any reason to change what's there. With, there's a few minor items um, like maybe uh, I think we're changing one window height on the east elevation and um, changing an opening where there was a staircase in the past. But otherwise, we're going back to the original drawings to recreate elements like the bay window as it was on the, um, the west elevation and um, just going through and re you know, rehabilitating what's there currently. Um, one thing that we are adding back is the, the building originally had shutters that we were looking to replace. So it has, um, looks a little bit more, it looks a little barren right now without them, the, the original drawings and the original photos that we went to had them in there. So um, that's an element we're adding back in. And then we feel like this um, new garage addition which is really necessary for our climate to have an attached garage to this house. We very much delineate, you know, separated it from the original structure. There's a clear delineate, delineation mark. So um, we have that distinction. Um, and it's in keeping with most of the homes on that, on Burton Street. So even Schmidt Garden and Martin did another house <laughs> earlier to this house at the Madeliner house with the Graham Foundation just um, west of here. And the original house had, had a garage that filled that space um, all the way to the alley. And that's what we're proposing here. And we've met with Landmarks. We had a larger, um, the garage was larger in the beginning. It came out further to Burton to the property line. Their recommendation was to resize the massing a little bit. We've adjusted our plans and uh, scaled it back a little bit. Um, so that's um, where we're at with the project now. Great, um, thank you. Um, any questions, commissioners? Um, seeing none. Um, Nice, uh, nice to see the effort to rehab the home and um, bring back some of the elements that are, you know, that were missing. Um, so we appreciate that, I think. And um, I think if there are no other questions from commissioners. Um, excuse me, excuse me. I just, this is Jack George. I'm, I'm the attorney for the owners of the property. And I just wanted to follow up on what Chris said and let you know that uh, we also did meet with the Gold Coast Neighbors Association with respect to this proposed changes that we're talking about. And uh, uh, they were they uh, were given the drawings, the changed proposed change drawings, and uh, 
both Matt Earhart, one of the other architects, and myself spoke with uh, Michael Perlstein from Gold Coast Neighbors. And I spoke again with them yesterday and uh, just to see where they were at. And he again, he indicated yesterday that Gold Coast Neighbors supports the proposed changes that we're making and that are before you today. And I, I just wanted to make that information available to you. And, and thank you again for giving us the opportunity to make the presentation today. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, I think if, any other, if there are no other, other questions from commissioners, I think um, we're ready to um, request a motion to adopt the staff recommendation uh, for the project. Um, do we have a motion? Motion to accept the recommendation. Commissioner Ponce, thank you, has made a motion. We have a second. Second, Commissioner Hughes. Commissioner Hughes, second. And um, I'm a yes as well. So uh, the motion carries unanimously. Um, nice project. Um, good luck. <laughs> Everything. Yeah. We're very excited. It's a nice project. All right. Thanks. All right. Um, thank you. Number three, um, item number three is 1357 North Elston, the 27th Ward, the Morton Salt Company Warehouse Complex. Proposed modifications to the previously approved rehabilitation of the existing industrial complex to include a new bridge and west entry ramp. Um, and Emily Barton will make the presentation. Thanks, Commissioner. So this is just a couple of modifications to what the commission approved when this um, development initially came in in fall of 2020. So similar to the previous proposal, the applicant is still proposing to retain the raised concrete loading dock and wood frame canopy directly west of the packaging buildings on the north side of the complex. Uh, the raised dock was previously proposed to be accessed by a sloped concrete path directly in front of the dock with a landscaped berm to the west. Um, in order to accommodate more parking, the applicant is proposing the elimination of the berm element and with it, the sloped concrete path. They instead are proposing a smaller switchback ramp on the north end of the raised dock. Um, approximately 30 feet long with one switchback to reach the three foot four inch height of the raised dock. The ramp will be constructed of concrete flanked by a metal handrail guardrail made of steel pipe and welded wire mesh panels. Um, because none of these proposed changes have an in adverse impact um, on any designated features, staff recommends approval as proposed with the condition that the steel pipe and mesh panels be finished in a dark non-reflective tone. Uh, so the other change, the applicant's also proposing to add a new open air sky bridge element connecting the third floor lounge and the packaging buildings to the West Shed. Prior to its dismantlement in 2015, after condemnation by the city, a conveyor connected to the packaging buildings and the West Shed that was used for transporting salt um, was removed and dismantled. Uh, the applicant's proposing to use the same opening on the south elevation of the packaging buildings for the new bridge. So this new bridge is proposed to be approximately 63 and a half feet long with a 1% slope and it will be open air. Um, it's it'll be nine feet wide between guardrails and it has a roof structure um, approximately 11 feet above the structural steel floor. It's designed to be industrial looking in order to fit with the rest of the complex and will feature metal mesh railings similar to those on the switchback ramp. Um, you can see an elevation that shows the visibility of the new proposed bridge. Um, and LED strip lighting is proposed to be concealed along the lower I-beams. Although never an original feature to the building, the proposed bridge is contextually appropriate and there's precedence for raised elements connecting the structures. Because of these reasons and the industrial nature of the complex, staff recommends approval as proposed. Um, and I believe we have a representative of the developer here, if you have any questions for him or for me. Thanks so much, Emily. Um, do we have any questions for Emily before we go to the applicant? Uh, seeing none, uh, can we hear from the applicant? Please, uh, is it David Duder?
Um, I see we, that. We might have lost him. I know he was on. It seems both, like he's there, but. He was on both computer and, and phone, but. Okay. He's... Um, <laughs> any questions for the applicant before we, from the commission? Um, I don't see any at this time. So we can, is uh, David there, Dave? Um, I am, I am, I'm here. Can you hear me now? Oh, yes, we can. Okay, excellent. I was on uh, a cell phone as well. Um, uh, we appreciate all of landmark support, uh, which started a couple of years back. And uh, um, even though there's, there's only just a couple of uh, minor modifications here, um, we appreciate the flexibility and kind of this ongoing uh, development here. And we're, we're real excited to uh, uh, see this project continuing to move forward with, uh, with completion here in the side of the next year. But uh, again, uh, continue to um, uh, thank the, the group for all the support. Uh, including these minor modifications. Great, thank you. Um, any questions from commissioners? Um, seeing none, um, I guess I'm just curious. So next year is, uh, I know that the, uh, um, the Morton Salt logo is kind of going away, that that's gonna be, you looking to open next year, right? So then that would be kind of the finishing touch. Uh, the Morton, the Morton Salt logo is actually uh, uh, was in a temporary state over the course of the winter. Um, the winter was not uh, kind to it. It uh, tended to kind of uh, shred it and rip up the, the temporary vinyl that was applied over the winter. Um, but it's in the process of being uh, repainted as we speak and should be completed in another uh, week or two. Oh, great. Uh, so do a drive by in, an, in another uh, few <laughs> weeks and it should be, uh, should be bled back to all of its glory. All right, cool. Good to know. Um, any other questions, commissioners? Uh, seeing none, uh, I think I'd like to request a motion to adopt the staff recommendation for the project. Do we have a motion? Yes, uh, an, an exceedingly yes, so moved from Commissioner Hughes. Thank you, Commissioner Hughes. Uh, and do we have a second? Yes, we have a second. <laughs> Commissioner Ponce has made a second and I'm a yes. Um, so this motion carries unanimously. Um, all right, looking forward to seeing the project progress and get to the finish line here. Thank you. Um, number four, I don't know four, 530 West Fullerton in the 43rd Ward, Mid-North District. This is the proposed removal of existing um, rear raised one-story frame church annex and replacement with new two-story masonry rear addition. Emily Barton for the presentation. Yes, thank you. So this project is at the Church of Our Savior in the Mid-North District, which is located um, on Fullerton between Geneva Terrace and Clark Street. Uh, so behind the main stone church, there's a one story with basement frame annex addition. Sanborn maps indicate that this addition has been around in some capacity since at least 1891. Although a very early addition to the main church, the annex is frame rather than masonry and has always been secondary to the main sanctuary space. The annex roof line is flat, differing from the dramatic pitch of the church roof and the building itself is unornamental and rather utilitarian in design. Although no permit information was found, based on the current materials and condition, staff believes the annex has been modified over its history. Based on Sanborn maps, um, we also were able to tell that from the late 1800s through at least the mid 1920s, the annex was blocked entirely from view. Um, along Fullerton by residential homes to the east. And this is also confirmed in early historic photographs like the one you see here. 
So the applicant is proposing to remove the rear frame annex in its entirety so that they can build a new modern annex that better serves their charity needs. Uh, they've provided demolition calculations to evaluate the percentage of the building to be removed. And based on this information, the 40% threshold requiring full commission and city council review is not triggered by this scope because only 31% of significant features are proposed to be removed. Because the rear annex is utilitarian design is clearly a secondary addition to the main church and the fact that the structure was historically not visible from the street, staff recommends that the removal of the frame rear addition will not be an adverse effect to the building or the district. The church is proposing to build this new annex um, to house programmatic elements for their uh, important charity work. The building footprint will be largely similar um, approximately 70 feet north to south and 82 and a half feet east to west. This is a little bit wider than the existing annex. Um, it's also proposed to be 31 foot eight inches tall and contemporary in design. This is also slightly taller than the existing annex was, but maintains the same general um, proportions. The first floor is proposed to feature a glazed storefront at the south entry vestibule, which is outlined, you can see in orange uh, on the proposed first floor plan. This vestibule is approximately three feet north of the rear wall of the church sanctuary. Between the rear wall and this addition is an inset hyphen connection, which I've indicated in red. Um, the setback is partially repeated on the second floor However, a small portion of the room there, which is meeting room 214 on the second floor, projects out approximately two foot six inches towards the church in front of the hyphen connection. So in order to further visually separate the two structures, staff is recommending that the design shall be modified to eliminate the portion of the Southeast meeting room that extends past the hyphen so that there is a clear delineation between the historic construction and the new annex. Staff further recommends that the hyphen portion of the addition that connects the historic church to the new annex shall be glazed, um, either in clear or spandrel glass, to emphasize the connection. The applicant has provided visibility studies from Fullerton to evaluate how the new annex will read from the public right of way. The new construction will be clad in masonry, either Roman brick or Norman brick in a neutral off-white or tan color. Punched window openings are proposed with metal window surrounds and four courses of recessed masonry detailing will span the building at the heads and sills. Um, a support letter from Alderman Smith's office was included in your packet. Um, I'm here if you have any questions, as are uh, representatives of the congregation and their architect. Thank you, Emily. Any questions? Do the commissioners have any questions for Emily before we hear from the applicant? Seeing none, uh, let's hear from the applicant. Hi, hi, everyone. It's good to be with you. My name is Brandon Cox. I'm the uh, junior warden of Church of Our Savior. Uh, and uh, it's hard not to be part of uh, what you guys do and not be grateful for everything that you do for our community as it relates to pre preservation. Uh, we have a very uh, progressively orthodox uh, Episcopalian parish uh, that has been really charts its history back to uh, sheltering uh, protesters uh, during the 68 uh, convention all the way through to the charity work that we do called Care for Friends that we've launched uh, and has been active uh, really since that time. Um, and so we've got a, a really just a history of service to the community as in addition to uh, the, the church, uh, you know, activities itself. And so it's uh, great to be with you to talk about uh, this building that will allow us to really grow our programming uh, for those uh, underserved populations, uh, but then also uh, more, uh, more appropriately serve uh, the, the church population as well. And I'm joined by Todd Zima, our architect, and uh, Anthony Cacciato uh, from JLL. Great, thanks so much. Um, any questions for the applicant, uh, commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Hughes? I, I have a question. Was there a um, 
in opposition to the building frontage stopping where the staff recommended because it looked like in the renderings it was still propelled forward. Hi everybody, I, I'll take that question. This is Todd, I'm Todd Zima with MKB Architects. Thanks for having us here. We had uh, hoped to have that conversation. Thanks Commissioner Hughes for bringing it up. And simply because our intention using the historic church's language uh, as a basis was to take the idea of a kind of a mini tower that would match. Emily, can you pull that visual up, please? Sorry, keep going, Todd. Sure. Um, the, the historic language at the front of the church has several tower elements with entries directly below them. And one of the things that was part of the brief from Church of Our Savior and Care for Friends, who runs part of the nonprofit um, inside this building, was to try to create a new welcoming entrance that was noticeable from the street. This will be the new, the main accessible entrance for this building. There are currently three different entrances on the Fullerton uh, Parkway side that serve, two of them serve the church, one of them serves uh, a rectory building, which is kind of an office annex of the church. So what we're trying to do here, and, and as, as we've discussed with, with staff, is both allow the reveal between the buildings, but also emphasize this entrance in a way that in a contemporary sense, echoes the way that entrances have been emphasized on the other portions of the building. And I think the only disagreement we have here is that we really don't want it to become too flat and, and uh, kind of pushed back to be uh, look like a box pushed up behind the building. We're trying to add some uh, a design element to it that emphasized it. You can see the red color inside that, um, outside of the red that's placed on the reveal that Emily mentioned in the yellow on the top, there's like a red tone inside, which reflects the red front door of an Episcopalian church. And this idea is that this is a, a contemporary tower element that addresses the street with a formal, you know, kind of presence and doesn't get totally diminutive. We think that's, our, our position is that we think that's an appropriate way to treat the historic building because it is so far back from the street in the least historic, uh, historically significant side of the building, which was formally covered by the residences that uh, were cited and now needs to be recognizable as, as a place to go for this property. So we were hoping to hear the commission's thoughts on that and we'll follow the direction that we get from this meeting. Thank you for the explanation. Um, I, I do believe that there are, I do believe in kind of announcing the entrance and um, you know, sort of drawing attention to that to create a welcoming feel, but um, have you explored other ways of doing that? Because I do think this is, um, to the staff's point, it is, you know, sort of impeding on that original structure. So have you guys explored other options of how you may kind of celebrate this entrance? I think our, our first pass at it is to do something similar to what Emily's indicated here and remove it essentially. We'll probably need a small overhang instead to protect people from the weather when they're waiting to come inside the building. There'll be a security intercom here to announce people. Um, and we would lose some program space on the inside of the building, but we'd keep a corner window the way that, that it's represented here as an indication that it's an important room above, which we, in the program it is. Yeah, I, I'd recommend, um, I hear what you're saying, Todd, I'd recommend, you know, sort of exploring that visually um, and presenting it to the staff. Um, I personally do agree with uh, their comments here about the kind of making sure there's that delineation and separation between the two structures. But other than that, um, I do applaud you guys for really sort of respecting the original heritage of the building, sort of the proportions and the windows, um, you know, the voids versus the solids seem very intentional, the height, everything has um, great consideration for the original structure. So um, thank you guys for that. I think yeah, I um, also agree with the recommendation, staff recommendation. I was just curious, how far does it come overhang? Is it an, is it, does it align with that break? Yes. 
it's intended to stay behind the church, but um, match. It's, it's slightly behind the, the north end of the historic yeah. building. It, sorry, Dad, don't want to cut you off. Um, it, it, it projects out approximately two foot six inches forward. Um, which is still behind, you know, the rear wall of the church, um, just kind of blocking that hyphen connection. Yeah, I would agree, um, you know, just a little bit more explor exploration on how to treat that entrance. But I think that I'm pretty confident that you would come up with a winning solution. I mean, it's almost there. So it's a it's a beautiful project. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, can I ask a question to the commission and, and I guess to Emily at the same time, but if we were to just move this entire um, form north further, would that satisfy your concerns? Meaning? Like keep, oh, yeah. Just, just move it um, out of the way of that red thing. Yeah, yeah, but just keep it, um, keep the same kind of detailing and corner window and everything. I think that that's, I think really just kind of getting that pushed back um, is what we're looking for. So I definitely think there's some flexibility in what that looks like. And in, in that break, that will be glass and maybe showing it in the rendering will help emphasize how that is going to look. We can work on that, yes. Um, we had detailed it with, with a black metal. That would be a similar look, but we'll, we'll explore how to do detailing with spandrel blazing because the, the area behind that is an insulated kind of hallway with the door that opens in front of it. So it would kind of just like maybe a spandrel panel if the, if the commission feels it needs to be blazing, then we'll explore that as a yeah, I think that was my other comment uh, to the staff. Um, I'm a little bit concerned. I know that we've kind of, we've approved the glass separations in the past um, and we have the precedent for that, but I'm a little bit, um, I, I would be interested in us exploring additional op options that are more sustainable than glass. Cause I think of Chicago winters and, you know, um, or some of our really hot days in the summer. And, you know, that space, um, conditioning that space probably is quite a lift um, if it's glass in the winter time. So um, I'm open to seeing other options. I think the biggest thing, which I agree with the staff on, is making sure that it delineates itself from the original structure. Okay. So it sounds like um, the, the motion may be uh, sort of. Um, I think the, I, I motion for us to accept all of the staff recommendations with the modification that the, um, what is that space called, Emily? Uh, the the connector, we, we call it like a hyphen connector. The hyphen. So I motion that we accept all of the staff recommendations with the modification that the hyphen um, materiality can be explored as long as it delineates itself from the original structure. As well as the cantilever being, it sounds like there's a compromise there with the cantilever. Oh, I think, I think the, both uh, Commissioner Ponce and myself were in support of the staff recommendations for uh, shifting that back. Okay. Uh, and Todd, is that, what you, is that what you said or did you say that you were looking like at an in-between cantilever? I think we're going to need to move it back. I don't think okay because um, otherwise the hyphen reveal I'm realizing talking to you here is going to simply get wider and the same issue will exist. And okay. That seems to be the the one that is um, you know not working. That 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 reveal would be covered by a portion of the new building. 
So it'll most likely look more like a, a box with the same corner features. The building, I mean, will look more like okay. a box. Um, and with that, I think there's a motion on the table for an amended staff recommendation um, to um, Commissioner Hughes, if you want to help me with it, it's basically to um, explore the hyphen connection material further. But basically, the, uh, we're adopting the staff recommendation as is, but to explore material of that hyphen connection. Is that correct? That's, what, that's okay. right. All right. So there's a motion on the table. Do we have a second? Like, yes, there is a second. Uh, motion by Commissioner Hughes um, amended. Uh, staff recommendations um, seconded by uh, Commissioner Ponce, um, and I will uh, also be a yes on that. Um, and so the amended motion carries unanimously. Um, it's a really, really nice project. You guys should be really proud and good luck. Um, I know you're going to figure it out. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Um, all right, project number five. 858 West Belden, uh, the 43rd Ward McCormick Row House District, the proposed construction of a new one story rear addition and one story side addition and uh, Joyce Ramos School. For the presentation, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The subject property is a two and a half story end unit of a, end unit of a seven unit row. The architect contacted staff about the project in February and submitted revised plans and elevations in June. The building shown on the drawings in blue, or the building shown on the drawings in blue is located on a lot approximately 37 feet wide by 104 feet in depth. The applicant is proposing to construct a one-story side addition shown in yellow, which is approximately six feet wide and 18 feet deep, and is proposed to be set back approximately 30 feet from the front facade. The applicant is also proposing to construct a one-story frame addition located behind the existing residence, also shown in yellow, and is approximately 20 feet wide and 12 feet deep, and is proposed to be set back approximately 20 feet from the rear property line. The side and rear additions are proposed to be 16 foot two inches in height and will be clad with wood or composite panels and trim with a standing seam metal roof. Divided light casement windows with transoms will be installed on the first floor and divided light casement windows will be installed on the basement level. In contrast to a more solid masonry addition, a paneled glass enclosure uh, may be seen as an ancillary structure to the main residence. Within the district, there is one end unit that is part of a five unit row located at 832 West Belden that has a historic one story frame site enclosure, which appears to have been reclad with new metal and glass walls. Similarly to 832 West Belden, the proposed side addition of the sub subject property is substantially set back from the front facade. Since the proposed side addition is located towards the rear of the home and will no longer be minimal and will be minimally visible from the public rights of way, and since the rear addition is no higher or wider than the historic mm -hmm. structure, staff recommends that the massing and materials of the proposed additions will not adversely affect the architectural character of the building or district. Additionally, staff will review and approve dimension window and cladding material details um, and material samples with uh, permit application should also be submitted for review. The applicant is also proposing to replace the existing windows on the rear elevation with new clad wood double hung windows and add new masonry openings for new windows on the west and rear elevations to match the size and configurations of the existing windows as indicated on the drawings. And these walls are secondary elevations and the proposed new windows are compatible with the existing window locations and configurations. Staff recommends approval for the new windows as proposed and the permit drawing shall include dimension details of the new masonry openings and windows. Staff recommends approval for the new scope of work for the conditions mentioned during this presentation and also listed here on this slide. Both Alderman Smith and the Sheffield Neighborhood Association have reviewed the proposal and submitted letters of support, which were included in the packets. This concludes my presentation. If you have any questions about my presentation or for the architect who is here today, please let us know. Thank you. Thanks so much, Joyce. Um, any questions for Joyce? Seeing none, um, let's hear from the applicant. Is it uh, David Rhino Ogden?
is the uh, applicant here. Um, I'm mute. There we go. Hello. Okay, Great. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you. I, I think, God, what, what I want to thank Joyce for all of her help and Landmark's crew and a picture in Joyce's description are worth a thousand words. I'll just, I'll take any questions. We're trying to keep it as obvious oh, edition. Yeah. Uh, you just identify a yourself and house feel to it. So <laughs> you just uh, identify yourself. Uh, yeah, David, Rain with David with Reno Ogden Architects. Oh, okay. Great. Thank you so much. Um, any questions for, for the architect? Uh, seeing none. Um, uh, any, any points of discussion the commissioners would like to um, make? Seeing none, um, there being no further discussion, I think we're ready to make a motion. Uh, I'd like to request a motion uh, to adopt the stack recommendation for the project. Do we have a motion? Motion. Uh, so moved. moved. Commissioner Ponce, thank you. Uh, do we have a second? Second, Commissioner Hughes. Seconded by Commissioner Hughes, and I'm a yes as well. So the motion carries unanimously. Um, you know, good luck with the project. Thank you very much. Well thank you all. Well done. Thanks. Okay. Um, item number six, 5054 South Greenwood in the fourth board, Kenwood District. It's the proposed new construction of a raised three story masonry single family residence with three car garage and curb cut on a corner lot. And uh, Emily, take it away. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Commissioner. So, this is a vacant lot located on the corner of Hyde Park in Greenwood, um, directly across from the KAM Isaiah Israel Temple. So the existing lot has a raised yard on a concrete retaining wall. The applicant is proposing to retain this and build the new house on the raised lot. The proposed building will have a 34 foot front setback, which is compatible with other homes in the district and especially along Greenwood. Front setbacks along Hyde Park range anywhere from nine foot eight inches to 71 foot seven inches. Because the subject property is located on a corner, the building side setback to the south is being compared to the front setback of the rest of the houses that face Hyde Park. The applicant is proposing a south side setback of approximately six foot seven inches. And although this is narrower than the other than the front setbacks on on the block, staff is taking into consideration the size and direction of the lot, as well as the wide range of side setbacks on the subject block and recommend that the proposed setbacks are appropriate and compatible. The property currently has no alley access. Um, the new garage is proposed to face Hyde Park Avenue and matches the home setback along the street. Uh, the majority of the homes along Greenwood have curb cuts and driveways off of Greenwood, but due to the limited width of the subject lot, the applicant is proposing their curb cut along Hyde Park, um, which also has cuts within the area. They range anywhere from eight feet to 25 feet, and the proposed 18 feet is within this range. So the proposed building is approximately 58 foot three inches east to west and 39 feet north to south with a 20 foot wide raised rear patio to the west. The building will be approximately 46 feet, feet tall from the sidewalk and 43 feet five inches from the top of the existing raised lot. The applicants provided neighborhood contextual information that shows predominant roof lines in the area and um, the proposed Heights are well within the range of historic buildings in the district. Um, the building will have a front porch, uh, which is also compatible in scale with the remainder of the houses in the district at approximately three foot six inches above grade of the raised lot. So the proposed masonry building has a gable roof line with two metal bays on the front facade and a raised front porch. Another smaller gable faces north and the rear of the home has a roof deck with a substantial masonry chimney. The front elevation of the home is largely symmetrical with the addition of the roof gable facing north. 
The multi-paned windows with limestone surrounds or limestone headers are design elements that occur, occur throughout the district as are gabled roofs with extended masonry walls. Staff recommends that the windows have either true or simulated divided lights with applied muttons and spacer bar and that window and door details be submitted with the permit application. As previously mentioned, the new design features a raised patio to the west of the house, which matches that of the front porch. The applicants put together some examples from within the district showing historic examples of similar raised patios. Based on the design elements and the neighborhood contextual information compiled, uh, staff recommends that the proposed design respects the general historic and architectural characteristics of the district. So the new building is proposed to be clad in cream color brick and limestone. The roof will be clad in synthetic slate shingles with stone coping. Um, uh, staff recommends that these are compatible materials and approval as proposed with all new material samples to be provided to staff with the permit application. Um, and so that is the end of me, but I have, if you have questions, I'm here. Um, and we also have the architect and ownership um, of the new house. Great. Um, thank you, Emily. Do we have any questions for Emily? Um, seeing none, um, let, let's hear from the applicant. Um, I believe they're here. I'm sure, we'd be happy to speak. Um, good afternoon. My name is Robin Taylor, and my husband Maurice is also on the call here, as is our um, architect, Jean, as well. Um, so we have been in Chicago for about a decade. Uh, we got married here. We own a home here. Uh, we had our son here, and we're expecting a second kid, um, a little girl, in September. We have long been fans of the Kenwood Hyde Park neighborhood, and we're so excited to become residents. So happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, and congratulations. Uh, any, any questions, commissioners? Um, seeing none, any points of discussion? Um, and with that, seeing none, I, I think the, the renders are quite beautiful, nice presentation. Um, and I'd like to um, uh, request a motion to adopt a staff recommendation. Do we have a motion? Um, agreed. Um the presentation being very clear um, from your architect. So thank you. Um, I motion us to accept the staff recommendations. Thank you, Commissioner Hughes. Uh, May second that motion. Oh, thank you, Commissioner Ponce. And <laughs> I am a yes as well. <laughs> uh, motion carries unanimously. You know, wonderful project. Um, good luck. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. So, uh, Item number seven, 671 North State, 42nd Ward, near north side, multiple property district, the proposed new one-story rooftop addition and roof deck. And Emily, you got this one. Oh, cool. yes, yes I do, okay. Um, so the applicant for this property is proposing to rehabilitate both the interior and exterior of the subject building which was previously occupied by a dental office with an apartment on the top floor. The new program will feature two separate offices on the first floor with a three bedroom duplex apartment on the second and third. A rooftop addition and roof deck are being proposed as a private amenity deck for the residential unit. Uh, so as you may remember, this was a pretty recent designation um, and language was built into the ordinance to allow for um, recognizing the context of the buildings in this district. Um, so uh, in recognition of the context for the buildings in this district located in the urban core with some of the city's highest building density, often including high rises, um, are subject to review on a case-by-case -case basis, the commission may approve visible additions to buildings. Um, the commission's review of proposed work should ensure that the historic features of the buildings are preserved long term while allowing reasonable change and flexibility to meet continuing and new needs. So for mid-block buildings, which this is, 
visible additions may be approved that are set back from the property from the front property line to a depth of approximately one half of the building lot so that the historic building continues to read as an independent structure. Um, so the applicant is proposing a new rooftop addition, um, approximately 10 foot nine inches um, towards the front property line, which is you know, well under 50% of the 25 foot lot size. Um, and then it is approximately 23 feet east to west. Um, the addition is proposed to extend eight foot three inches above the building's parapet and will be clad in a vertical dark gray siding with a dark bronze sliding door. The design is contemporary and simple so as to not distract from the historic building below. Um, this building has a uniquely small footprint and is approximately 23 feet from front to back, taking up the entirety of its lot. So because of this and the fact that the addition will read um, as separate and contemporary to the historic building, staff recommends approval as proposed with the condition that material samples be submitted to staff with permit application. So the new rooftop addition is proposed to serve as access to a new roof deck to the immediate west. The deck is proposed to be 10 foot 8 inches east to west and 17 foot 9 inches north to south with a 42 inch glass guardrail. Because this will be visible from the street, the applicant has provided a series of visibility studies to show the impact the deck will have on the existing building. Because of the shallow building depth, the deck will be visible from every location shown, however, it is only minimally visible beyond the new addition. Uh, because the railing will be glass, the new deck only has a small impact on the visibility with the addition as the main visual focus, and staff recommends that um, neither of these elements will have an adverse impact on the roofline of the building. So in addition to repainting the building's wood windows, the applicant is planning to repaint the existing painted masonry. Um, staff was unable to find photos of the building from the period of significance, but as early as 1965, um, the building has been painted. So ordinarily, staff discourages the painting of masonry as it can trap water against the brick and lead to damage. In this case, however, because the building has been painted for nearly 60 years, there are likely many layers of paint that have been added over time. Per the architect, the existing masonry facade has some limited cracking and evidence of limited spalling. Given the age of the clay brick, there is concern that the removal of the paint may cause further damage to the face of the brick, exacerbating potential moisture infiltration and further deterioration. Um, there is a National Park Service brief that kind of discusses cleaning historic masonry buildings, and they agree that even where unpainted masonry is appropriate, the retention of the paint may be more practical than removal in terms of long range preservation of the masonry. Trying to remove all of the paint could severely damage the brick and therefore staff recommends in this limited case that repainting the masonry will not have an adverse effect on the building. Um, so staff is recommending approval as you've seen. Um, and if you have any questions for me, I'm here. Also a representative from the architect's office is here as well. Thank you, Emily. Um, any questions for Emily from the commission? Yes. Um, Commissioner Hughes? Thank you. I know this, um, I know the, the renderings that we saw is just an illustration, but is it going to look like that in real life? It, it's looking very shed-like. And I know the purpose is to, to delineate itself from the existing building, but not this, can you go back to the elevation? Yeah, this here. Is it gonna look like that? I think the, the hope that we have, and this is very similar to the guidelines that we give for visible additions in Fulton Market, um, that you know, the simpler, the better, generally speaking. Um, and you know, to be a darker color so as to, to kind of fade more into the background of all of the buildings behind it. That was our, that was our intention with this. Okay. Are you reacting to the vertical panels or? I think so. I, it just, it, it feels very shed like, um, which I, again, I understand that we want, 
we want minimum, you know, replication of the existing, but um, maybe the architect can tell me a little bit about the material choices. Sure. Is the architect here? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi, uh, I'm Alex. Uh, on behalf of the architecture team, my principal is actually more informed on the design, but he is out on vacation right now. But I think the the point with this, with the materials at least, the dark gray is kind of meant to evoke the dark gray window surrounds and sort of the accent masonry that is on the building if we see, you know, pictures of the existing facade. So kind of to blend in with that. And then, yeah, kind of like was already mentioned, tried to keep the form just as simple and in the background as possible. Uh, so it is yeah. color accenting what is existing on the building. Yeah, it has the added benefit um, like Emily said, with the dark color trying to fade away, but also it kind of does match part of the existing building as well. Okay, that helps. <laughs> <laughs> Emily, can you go back to one of the, uh, the pictures of the building? Oh, there you go. Okay. Yeah. It's gonna be it's gonna be hard to see too. It's that parapet so well. I guess the parapet isn't that tall. It's kind of deceiving. It's the whole floor in, in there. <laughs> there's a yeah. There's a <laughs> sneaky third floor hidden in there. <laughs> Never mind. It's not very tall at all. Okay. <clears throat> all right. Will will materials be submitted for that? They have the final material on that. Okay. Does that answer your question, Commissioner Hughes? It does, thank you. All right. Um, any points of discussion, commissioners? Thoughts? Um, seeing none, I, I think I'd like to request a motion to adopt a staff recommendation for the project. Um, do we have a motion? So moved, Commissioner Hughes. Thank you, Commissioner Hughes. Do we have a second? Second, Commissioner Ponce. Thank you, Commissioner Ponce. Um, and I'm a yes as well. So the motion carries unanimously. Um, congratulations. Thank you. Um, number eight of nine, 2211 West Walton, the second ward, Ukrainian Village District. The proposed new roof deck and pergola atop an existing, oh, two flat. Yes, I remember this one. Um, Joyce, take it away. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In March 2020, a permit application was received by um, Historic Preservation Division staff to, uh, for a proposed new rooftop addition. This project was initially reviewed by the Permit Review Committee last month in June, which included a visible rooftop addition that had an adverse effect to the historic roof line. At the meeting, the committee directed the applicant to continue working with staff on the design and to return to a future PRC meeting for review and decision. The applicant has since revised their proposal to eliminate the rooftop addition to just include a roof deck above the main house in a pergola located towards the rear of the building. A roof deck shown on the third floor plan here in green is proposed to be set back 20 feet from the projecting bay on the front facade, 17 feet from the principal facade, and two feet from both side elevations. A 42 inch high wood guardrail shown in orange on the elevations will wrap around the roof deck and will extend one foot seven inches past the top of the parapet. A new rear addition that is no higher or wider than the main house is still proposed. Above the rear addition and on a portion of the main house will be an 18 foot wide by 18 foot long by eight foot eight inches high aluminum pergola shown on the drawings in yellow. The pergola will extend six foot nine inches past the top of the parapet and the front of the pergola is set back 56 feet from the projecting bay on the front facade, 53 feet from the principal facade, and two feet from both side elevations. The front and rear elevations are open in design, and the side elevations have privacy screens constructed out of horizontal slats. 
The roof will be accessed by a stair enclosure shown on the drawings in blue that includes just a stair and a landing. Visible stair enclosures that have been approved in the past so long that they are no taller or larger than is required by code. The stair enclosure is an extension of the new stairs proposed for the floors below. The exterior walls of the stair enclosure will be set just inside of the parapet and the roof will follow the slope of the stairs and the highest part of this enclosure will extend six foot nine inches past the top of the parapet. The walls will be clad in a cementitious board um, and the roof will have shingles. Historic preservation staff recommends that the cladding materials to be a dark non-reflective color to differentiate it from the historic masonry. And samples of this cladding um, shall be submitted to staff for review and approval. The architect provided renderings taken from several vantage points along Walton. The guardrail and pergola do not appear to be visible. Mock-ups of the front elevation of the pergola, guardrails, and the steer enclosure were also constructed for staff review. Staff met with the architect and owners on site to review the mock-up and confirm that the front elevation of the pergola and guardrails would not be visible on Walton from several vantage points taken directly in front, west and east of the building. I will go through the various viewpoints on the following slides. Um, at this vantage point shown here, across the street, looking straight at the facade, the pergola and the guardrails will not be visible above the roof line and will have no impacts with the front facade. At this point, just west of the building, looking down the gangway, the pergola and the gargles will not be visible. At this point, across the street and west of the building, the pergola and the gargles will not be visible. At this point, across the street and further west um, of the building, the pergola and gargles will still not be visible. Um, at this point, just east of the building, looking down the gangway, the pergola and the gargles are also not visible. Um, at this point, across the street, east of the building, the pergola and garbles will not be visible. The stair enclosure will be visible. Um, you can see it's still over here. And also in the mark over here. And finally, at this point, across the street and further east of the building, the pergola and garbles will not be visible. Um, similarly to that last viewpoint, the stair enclosure will still be visible. Uh, and based on the mock up and digital renderings, Staff recommends that the proposed new pergola and guardrails will not have an adverse impact on the roof line of the front facade of the building or overall district and may be approved. Alderman Hopkins has reviewed the project and has no objection. The Ukrainian Village Neighborhood Association also reviewed the project and submitted a letter of support. This concludes my presentation. Please let me know if you have any questions. Uh, the owner, uh, architect, and builder are also here if you have any questions for them. Thank you. Thanks so much, Joyce. Um, any questions for Joyce? If not, let's hear from the uh, applicant. You're on mute, I think. Well, Laszlo, can you just unmute yourself, please? Um, Laszlo, I think you're still on mute. OK, hey, now we're official. Sorry about that. I just got a text from my client and her mother is ill. So unfortunately she can't make it, um, her regrets. And uh, thank you for having us uh, on for your, uh, uh, for this meeting. Thank you. Do you have any, any concerns with the, with the staff recommendations? No. No? Okay. Um, all right, any questions for commissioners? Seeing none, um, I think I'd like to request a motion to adopt the staff recommendation for the project. Do we have a motion? So I move, Commissioner Hughes. Commissioner Hughes made a motion. Do we have a second? Second, Commissioner Ponce. Seconded by Commissioner Ponce. I'm a yes. This motion carries unanimously. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and we are now at um, the final item. Number nine, 1107 West Fulton Market, the 27th Ward, Fulton Randolph Market District, proposed construction of new facade and new interior floor structure within existing four-story non-contributing building. Emily Barton, uh, please take it away. Yes, I will, thank you. Uh, so this property is mid-block on Fulton Market, um, located between Aberdeen and May. The proposal includes retaining the existing rear and side walls of the subject four-story building and rebuilding the front facade, which was removed prior to district designation. 
Although the scope is just for the new facade, full interior rehab is proposed to move forward once the design is approved. Um, the phasing is proposed so that any revisions required won't affect interior layout um, and will be able to be reviewed by commission staff. Because the majority of the front facade was demolished prior to district designation and has not been replaced, staff believes that the full commission and city council review regarding 40% of demolition is not triggered. Um, a report by a licensed structural engineer addressing how the existing building elements to remain shall be supported, braced and protected in situ during the demolition of the portion of the existing front facade and interior structure shall be included with the permit app. The re recommended measures, sequencing and protection should be incorporated in the structural and architectural permit drawings. So based on previous proposals, the existing building is 44 foot nine inches tall um, and is missing some of the interior <laughs> floor structure. Um, so the applicant is proposing on constructing new floors at different elevations, um, 16 foot four inches for the first floor, 12 feet for the second, third and fourth floors, um, making the new overall building height 55 foot four inches. Um, Three bays of windows are proposed with masonry piers in between. Um, the windows are proposed to be steel casement windows with 12 divided lights. Um, the first floor panels include a one foot two inch tall decorative metal bulkhead um, and an eight inch metal transom bar divides the, divides the storefront from transom windows. Three entrances are proposed with two flanking the far sides and one as a central double door. Um, a shallow projecting cornice is also proposed uh, the applicant has proposed a brick and limestone facade, and while the final brick selection has not been made, it will be red in tone. Decorative metal paneling is integrated into the new design. Staff recommends that the window and storefront frames have a dark, non-reflective finish, and all masonry and mortar samples should be submitted for staff review and approval um, with the permit application. Uh, because this building is non-contributing, the applicant is not required to maintain the existing height so long as the new height is compatible within the district's historic context. Um, the applicant, in addition to providing a streetscape elevation showing the neighboring context, the applicant has provided examples of buildings with very similar floor proportions. Um, although the proposed heights do not align with the immediately adjacent context, the examples provided as well as previously approved new construction in the area um, within the district show that the proposed elevation is compatible with the overall district and staff recommends approval as proposed. Um, I believe we have some troopers that made it through this whole time um, that are here if you have any questions for them or me too. <laughs> Thank you, Emily. Um, commissioners, uh, any questions for Emily? Um, and uh, seeing none, uh, let the applicant, it, it's been a long time. Would you like to say uh, something? <laughs> Hi. Hi. Uh, hello? Hello. I don't know if you could see me or not. It's probably better if you can't. <laughs> um, you. Oh, there I am. Hey, how are you doing? I'm actually, I was at work and I stepped out to the car, to, but I've been on the whole time. So it's been, hopefully the computer doesn't die. Hey, I want to first say thank you to the Landmark Commission. Thank you to Emily for all your communicating what the needs were and getting us through to that part of it so we can work on it. The property has been like this for a while and I, it's been a, a long project of ours to see it get through. And uh, I you think- You can first identify yourself really quick. Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Amy Hamada. I'm the owner of 1107 West Fulton Market. Thank you. I've owned the property since 19 or 2001 or two. So I've been there a while and uh, I'm very familiar with the area. And I'm also very, uh, I'm very aware of, of the architectural uh, um, value in that neighborhood and how it, I'm, I'm somebody that would have probably would have not liked to see all the new development, you know, I'm one of those guys, but I feel like our, our the architect, uh, Jeremiah Johnson did a good job of bringing something, uh, putting a, a facade on there that kind of resembles what's going on in the, in the area. And, and, and it does, you know, match the, the look of the historic, uh, what is it, texture or whatever the look of that neighborhood. So, hey, Emily, thank you for your help, by the way. Um, so anyway, we're excited to get going. It is a, it, there's a couple phases to it. We want to make sure the front got the facade got approved through landmarks and we got your, you know, your, we do, uh, we respectfully thank you for that. And then now we can go through the structural component, you know, to get through the design process with the engineering. And uh, I think that's what we, why we wanted to get this through, through landmarks at this time. So. 
Great, thank you. Um, commissioners, any questions for the owner? Um, seeing none, um, points of discussion. Looks like you guys did a nice job. You were very working well with Emily and it looks like a, a nice elevation. So um, I see Commissioner Hughes would like to make a statement. Yeah, I I agree. Um, this is this is really great, um, and we always love to see new life breathe and you know new life into dilapidated buildings or ones that are. I mean, it looks like it was in pretty bad shape, and also like kudos for adding all of the additional square footage too with the the extra floor um, because it's you know having to condition a space with double height ceilings or almost double height ceilings is is quite a lot. So um, I think you guys are introducing a sustainability component too that uh, we all appreciate. And I think the new facade is gonna be beautiful. So I commend you guys for the work that you've done. Thank you very much, Commissioner. And I also wanna say that I also appreciate the thought that you recognizing, cause I do, I'm not somebody that likes to knock down anything. I'd like to see it come back up. And unfortunately that facade was, falling off and it was it was because it probably somebody probably would have got hurt if i didn't pull it off and that was like years and years and years ago before it was landmarked and so anyway that being said uh we did have plans way back when to reconstruct it but then landmark the kind of the neighborhood started changing landmark stepped in and it took a little bit longer to get to that point so but thank you very much for those uh, comments that's very nice Absolutely. And I can certainly see that you guys have weaved the historic fabric back into the new facade. Um, and again, keeping in contact with the historic vernacular of the area. We're very excited about this one. Well, thank you. Yes, I agree. Um, this is definitely, I, I'm going to consider this a little gem in the Fulton area and your approach to it. Awesome. And, uh, you know, excellent way as we're closing in on the final, <laughs> final uh, project here. But um, uh, congratulations on your approach. Really nice. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Hughes. Thank you, Commissioner Ponce. Um, I'm going to echo both of those statements. And um, with that, I'd like to request a motion to uh, adopt a staff recommendation for the project. Do we have a motion? Yeah, come on. Come on. <laughs> so moved. Yeah. Let you take that one. So moved. I got to hear it. <laughs> um, I second that motion. Uh, Seconded by Commissioner Ponce. And I'm a, a yes. Um, motion carries unanimously. Great job. Congratulations, thank guys. Very much. Sarah, thank you. And Jeff, thank you, the architect and the attorney. And thank you for, to the, all the commissioners and the, and the landmark committee. Thank you, guys. Nice job, team. Um, all right. And that brings us to the end of this meeting today, marathon meeting. Um, no further, there's no further business today. So I'd like to request a motion to adjourn. So moved, Commissioner Hughes. There it is. Yeah. So moved, Commissioner Hughes. Do uh, you have a second? I second that motion. I am, uh, Commissioner thank you, Ponce. Commissioner Ponce, and I'm a yes as well. So the motion carries. Um, thanks, thanks everyone for your time. Uh, thank you, commissioners, for your service, and uh, good luck uh, with all the projects. So have a good thank one. You. See you all next month. Okay. Yeah. Bye. -bye. <laughs> thanks, guys. <laughs>